Good evening. On behalf of the Eugene O'Neill Foundation Dow House, I want to welcome you to our first Scholars Evening of 2021. I'm board member Carol Weinstra, and I'm so excited to introduce tonight's guest, Xander Britsky. Xander will be discussing his new book, Magnum Opus, The Cycle Plays of Eugene O'Neill with our artistic director, Eric Fraser Hayes. Uh, Xander, a renowned O'Neill scholar, is a native of Joplin, Missouri. He holds a BA from Missouri Southern, an MFA from the University of Alabama. Then he had the very good sense to travel west to California, where he earned his PhD from Stanford. Tonight, uh, Xander is in Montclair, New Jersey. Eric is at home a stone's throw from Dow House. And I'm just up the road in Walnut Creek, California. And we were commenting uh, before we started that that's one of the advantages of the Zoom and the pandemic is that we can have these coast to coast uh, events. Anyway, now let's get on with the conversation and let's get us started, Eric. Great, <clears throat> um, thank you. And, and uh, welcome to everyone there and uh, welcome especially to Xander. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us uh, for, for this talk about your, your new book. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things, uh, just just to give give people a sense of how we're uh, looking to roll tonight. And basically, I think Xander and I are gonna uh, I'm gonna have some questions for Xander, and we're gonna we're gonna talk for about the first 40 45 minutes, and then we want to open things up to questions uh, by you. And so I encourage anyone uh, when you have a question or you have an observation to share, please uh, do so in the in the chat function. Uh, tonight. Um, and, and Xander, I'll just say one thing uh, that Xander and I both agreed uh, when we talked last week that we thought that the most interesting thing that would happen tonight would, would definitely come from or be spurred by what you, our audience, have to say. Nothing we have to say. So anyway, um, uh, let's, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> uh, Xander, um, can you just start off? Um, I, know, I know some people here know a lot about the cycle, some people know a little, and maybe a few people know almost nothing. Um, so could you please just uh, kind of give us a, a sense of what is Eugene O'Neill's cycle? Um, well, that question is what got me started writing the book because uh, I realized after studying O'Neill for 20 years or so um, that I didn't know anything about his cycle plays. Uh, so uh, I started to take a look and uh, this question, what is the cycle, is possibly a, a question that's going to circulate throughout our, our talk uh, tonight. But in, a, in, in essence, it started out, he called it his cycle because it was a group of plays, uh, started out with a small number, ended up with a larger number that was ultimately to tell the story of America through the lens of a single family, seven generations of one family going from 1755 before the American Revolution to 1932, almost the time in which he wrote these plays. He wrote all these plays between 1935, the beginning of 1935 and June 1939 is when he stopped. The overall theme, why he called it a cycle also, was there separate plays, but the, each play was to circulate the uh, central theme, that being the corrosive effects of greed, materialism, possessiveness, and capitalism run amok. Okay, okay. Perfect for today. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> So can you give us a little uh, a little uh, overview of, of the cycle as far as the, the actual plays, what, what, what exists today, and maybe some of the things that were intended uh, that, that met, you know, that were developed up to certain points, perhaps? Sure. Um, well, uh, there was no grand plan for what he was going to try to accomplish. Uh, he started out uh, in January 1, 1935 with four plays, ideas for four plays. 
These were going to be four plays about four brothers from about 1858 to 1900. Um, he wrote ideas for each of those plays down. And then he decided, I need to talk about their parents. And that became the play that we know today as A Touch of the Poet, which is the only play among the cycle plays that is likely familiar with our audience tonight. So the play about the boy's parents was A Touch of the Poet. Then quickly thereafter, now at five plays, he thought, oh, I wanna talk about how, well, I wanna talk about the boy's parents' marriage. And that play became More Stately Mansions. Uh, so then now the cycle is up to six plays. After that, he decided he needed to br bring the, the cycle up to the present day. And that became a play ultimately called The Hair of the Dog, which was the original title of A Touch of the Poet. One of the things that's very confusing about these cycle plays is the interchangeability of titles. O'Neill changing his mind, shifting plays, the titles of one plays, putting the same play, the title of that onto another play. Um, but, he, but with this new play, The Hair of the Dog, he said, this can be play number seven. And it's actually a play that he had started, has its uh, history going back to as early as 1927. And it had, it had parts of several different titles ultimately became this play. Hmm. So at this point, at seven plays, uh, a Touch of the Poet is set in 1828. At this point, we're going 1828 to 1900. Hair of the Dog, this new seventh play, was going to be 1900 up to the present day. He can't go any further because that's when he's writing the play. So now he goes backwards. At a certain point, he decides he's interested in the boy's grandmother. And that became play number eight, which was before A Touch of the Poet. And then after that, he quickly decided, nah, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to write a play about the great ants, three great ants of these same boys. And that became play number nine. And then ultimately the cycle expanded to 11 plays when these plays eight and nine were enormously long plays, uh, double length plays. If you know Strange Interlude, they were about the same length as Strange Interlude. So he decided way late after he'd actually stopped writing the cycle ostensibly, he decided to add two more plays by tearing up or, or, or rearranging those two very long plays and turning them into four regular size plays, thus bringing the count up to 11. Okay, wow. Uh, and 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 um, can can you give us a little bit of a sense of the 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 publication and and the publication history and and its variations? I know it's changed over time. <laughs> yeah, also, you're, you're gonna you're gonna want to interrupt me on this one. Oh, okay, uh, <laughs> I'll be ready. Um, he there there were eleven up to eleven planned plays. He only definitively finished one play, the aforementioned A Touch of the, a Touch of the Poet, play number five. He possibly finished play number six, More Stately Mansions. I think he did. The woman whose research I'm building upon, Martha Gilman Bauer, definitively said that he did. A lot of other people say he didn't. We'll, 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 we'll get into that question, I'm sure. Okay. Um, those are the only two plays that survive. Uh, in our promo for this event, uh, it, it talks about these being the only two plays of his 11 plays that's, that survive today. It would actually be more accurate, and this is one of the things that I harp on a lot in the book, it would be more accurate to say that these two plays are the only plays he actually wrote. Okay, yeah. A Touch of the Poet was produced in Sweden in 1953, in the United States premiere in 1958. More stately mansions, and, you, and, and A Touch of the Poet is a play 
uh, Gabriel Byrne starred in 2005. I think that was the last Broadway production. Jason Robards starred in 1977. It's not produced on Broadway a lot for reasons we can talk about later, but it is considered one of his better plays. Uh, some people like it more than any other play. Um, I think it needs a companion, and that companion is more stately mansions, mm -hmm. which has a very odd history. And maybe we'll I'll talk about we can talk about maybe the publication history later. But Perfect. it has a, in fact been produced, and it was produced first in Sweden uh, in 1962, uh, in New York in 1967 in a production that starred. Um, Colleen Dewhurst, Arthur Hill, and in her return to Broadway, Ingrid Bergman. Uh, there were lots of stories of people sitting in the audience just with binoculars to look at Ingrid Bergman's legs. Um, production lasted 140 performances in New York. It, it premiered at the Amundsen Theater, actually opened the Amundsen Theater in Los Angeles, uh, then transferred to New York, it played for 142 performances. Uh, mostly on the star power of Colleen Dewhurst and Ingrid Bergman, and then has never been, has never returned since. In 1997, the uh, a Belgian uh, avant-garde director, Ivo Van Hove, directed a production at the Actors Theatre Workshop in New York, New York Theatre Workshop. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's actually a production you can see at the uh, New York Library for the Performing Arts and then one of their, you know, theater recording type things. Um, it was pretty controversial at the time, uh, highly adapted, although it used a, 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 an abridged script, uh, but it had, you know, everything you'd want in, a, in an avant-garde performance, uh, uh, cool staging, uh, stark lighting, uh, full frontal nudity, uh, some things maybe that O'Neill didn't put in the play, but uh, it's, uh, I was astonished how much I liked it when I saw it on tape. Uh, I, was, I, I was not in New York when it, when it, was, uh, it was here, but it was, it's, it's actually, I, I think, pretty fantastic. Um, and that has not produced, been produced since. Mm -hmm. And nothing else of the cycle has been produced either because, as I alluded to earlier, those plays weren't written. Right, right. Um, before before I, I want to take a, a turn into your 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 ideas about the play and, and and the cycle. Could could you just give us a real basic rundown of the of the characters? You know the the basic story. Give us a little bit of the story, just because then when we start talking character names, they'll understand a little sure. bit about where they yeah. fit. And I'll only talk about the characters who really exist. Um, okay. Uh, the, the four brothers whom this place, uh, who, where O'Neill started, they do, uh, they make sort of an appearance in, well, they do make an appearance in more stately mansions as young boys. Um, they're terribly written and are probably best removed um, as, as children in dramas generally are. Um, um, just, just a producer's opinion. Um, so, but they do, they do appear. Um, it, at the start of More Stately Mansions, the main character, Sarah Melody, uh, I'm calling her the main character. Other people would disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, but she is pregnant with her youngest child. And, and the year is 1832. And that child will live to 100 years old, and he will actually later speak the last line of the cycle in a play that O'Neill didn't write, that play being The Hair of the Dog, but he wrote some notes about it, and he wrote a final speech for it, although it was never published and never finished and never really written, even in a first draft. Of what we know, of what we have, what we'll be talking about later, we're, we're talking about an Irish family that has, has uh, first generation uh, that has settled outside Boston and the play concerns their adjustments as immigrants in New York or in Boston, in, in America, and the daughter Sarah Melody's 
marriage to Simon Harford, Yankee aristocracy, and it's their children who are the where the where the cycle starts, although that's not where it finishes. Um, so it's the the if you've seen a touch of the poet, you know the play revolves around Cornelius Melody. He's the owner of a tavern. He's come to he's come to America because he's been thrown out of his uh, host country, uh, his native country, Ireland. Uh, he was uh, and, and then and then England, uh, where he served in. Uh, Wellington's army was a uh, decorated uh, uh, soldier, uh, but was uh, cast out, almost court-martialed because he seduced some general's wife who oddly didn't like that and had him booted out. Um, so he's come to America and where he starts an inn and he is uh, uh, bamboozled, believe it or not, by the Yankees. Uh, and swindle. They actually, he, they told him, and this is a real estate story that would never happen today, but was told that the stagecoach would go right, the stagecoach to Boston would go right past the inn. Uh, but they, they built the interstate near him uh, and around him, or another main road rather, of course, not an interstate, but completely bypassing him and dooming this tavern to economic ruin from which he cannot recover. And his daughter, who was born in Galway, uh, is, is a young woman of 20, I think, when the play, when A Touch of the Poet starts. And she can't stand her father because he, he's full of bombast and pretends he's some great lord, rides around the countryside on this thoroughbred mare, pretending he's aristocracy, when they're poor as church mice and, and she and her mother have to do all the labor at the end. And then she's also mad because she thinks, well, you got swindled, so what? You could have, you know, you've got to bounce back from these setbacks. And, and she says, you know, this is America where you can be anything you want to be. And then goes further and says, if I were a man, I wouldn't have any problem. So she decides she's not going to be poor. And she sets her sights on marrying this, this man who doesn't appear in the play named Simon Harford, who's a, 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 a at, uh, He's bedridden upstairs at the tavern. They took him in. He was at, uh, at, at the uh, little cabin that the family owned for he, when he took ill. And so they take care of him. And Sarah concocts this plan that she will seduce and marry him and that way rise in the new world. This is complicated by the fact that she loves him. Uh, which is a which is a great twist in it. She she does want to rise socially, economically, but she also loves him dearly, very much, and sees him exactly for who he is. Um, so that's the really the story of the first play, and more stately mansions. The play that immediately follows it. It is about the rise of the Harfords with Simon and Sarah and their uh, development of various businesses, not unlike amazon.com, uh, where uh, you know it is a mighty river, but yes, it's taking over the world. And they're doing that with uh, a series of cotton mills and then uh, uh, enlarging their business to include banking, railroading, uh, shipping, uh, and hopefully putting one of their sons in the White House to bribe everybody else to go their way. Um, and that's the, and, and more stately mansions builds on this idea of wanting more and more and more. The question that always struck me uh, is one that, 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 get, that gets me. And that is Sarah keeps saying, I only want just enough. I only want just enough to live. Um, and so the question is, what's enough? Uh, when is enough enough? Uh, what is more than enough? And will enough ever be enough? Which is probably a question that a lot of you know people ask now in these in these shady times. The other thing about the play that's also interesting is it's set in the term of Andrew Jackson, uh, 
who was, of course, the first really outsider uh, president from you know Tennessee coming in, and the resonance between the way that they complain about Andrew Jackson and some of his policies and what he's doing to the country are not unlike some of the language that has been used to uh, describe a situation 200 years later. Um, I started writing this in 2017 when some of those parallels seemed ominously prescient. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic, thank, thank you, Xander. It, uh, one, one character that, uh, if you have anything to contribute about, um, the, the role of, of Deborah Harford, can you just say anything about, I mean, obviously she plays a role in all this too, Simon's mother? Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, <laughs> always good for me to uh, uh, omit the obvious. Um, Deborah is, appears in one scene in A Touch of the Poet, uh, and she's a major character in more stately mansions. Simon's mother, who once, who has had a very close and entangled relationship with her son in the past, um, uh, not unlike a lot of re relationships we might be familiar with. And she forms the triangle that works out the uh, plotting of more stately mansions of who's going to win possession of whom, uh, whether it be Sarah, Deborah, or Simon. In uh, uh, she, she, she O'Neill at a certain point early in the process felt that the cycle was revolving around Deborah. He put that in his work diary. Um, I would say that that was where he started to make his mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, fantastic. Um, uh, you know, uh, both Xander and I have a, a directing background, and so I would say that that would conclude our exposition part of the uh, tonight's <laughs> performance. Uh, but thank you, Xander, for indulging us and, and getting us all up to speed. So now everyone indulging knows the world we're in. So now something, now the action can take place. Um, but I, want, I wanted to just kind of take this turn here and, 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 and start by first saying that we're in 2021. And um, this represents 2021. There it um, is. But, but if we go back 20 years, uh, we have we have Xander's uh, book, The Aesthetics of Failure, and I just wanted to I just wanted to I, drop something out of this that uh, you wrote 20 years ago, and then as a comparison, see where you went. Um, but uh, you know, in 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 Aesthetics of Failure, which uh, was 20 years ago, you know, I think you do you do reference the idea of um, what a lot of people have thought, which is that the uh, fin the cycle was unfinished, um, and um, and that that. Uh, uh, I actually, I'm thinking, is it the, I, I feel like either in one, in, in this book or, or your current book, you mentioned the Gelbs, or maybe it was a discussion uh, between us, but I remember, I, I believe it's uh, the Gelbs that are, um, uh, express the view that more stately mansions is a matter of scholarly, scholarly rumination and not meant to be taken as art. Yes. Yeah. I did say that. Yeah, so 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 I, I felt that you know that, that that was kind of maybe what was the accepted view twenty years ago. I just wanted to read you one quick thing, um, uh, just just a couple lines actually. But it's I'm going to regret. I'm going to regret ever having written that book. Now. I just want I just want to say because in, in in Xander's book, uh, uh, this is from twenty years ago, but uh, you know which I really liked, and I, I've had an interesting, lively discussion uh, writing, on, writing in the margin with you. Um, but 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 you describe the dramatic action of of both these two plays, a touch of the poet and more stately mansions, in one sentence. And I think it's just kind of interesting that the the one sentence you use for the dramatic action of a touch of the poet is, a, a poor New England tavern owner clings to the image of himself as a Byronic hero. And in more stately mansions, you your dramatic action is uh, described as a young man fights to preserve his soul against the competing desire for material gains and conquests. And knowing that that now twenty years later, you're very focused on the role of Sarah. It, I, I mean, I think that's a real representation of of an evolution in your thinking. And I would love for you to share with us you know, your evolution and where you are now with th these plays and the idea of the cycle. Right, well, first of all, um, I always wanted to say that I wrote the book on failure. Um, so yeah, I, I got that out there. Um, th those are, uh, those, 
sentences you read are excellent representations of why my graduate advisor never told me to publish anything. So because you'll just regret it later on. Um, and I think he was talking to a group of people, but it's possible he was just talking to me, um, knowing what I might be capable of. Um, that that that's that's really terrific because that did that what what that represents is definitely a snapshot in time of what I was thinking when I did that. In fact, I didn't deal with more stately mansions at all in that book. Um, uh, that might be the only sentence where I talk about it. And you know, if you're only going to write one sentence, you ought to get it right. But I would say that's completely wrong. Um, but it does, it does, um, it could be right if you considered those two plays as separate plays and not as one event. That is, her father, Cornelius Melody, in some ways is the protagonist of A Touch of the Poet. Many productions are slanted that way. It makes, it makes perfect sense. In the second play, and as it has been produced both in 1964 uh, or 1967 in the Jose Quintero production, and even in the avant-garde Ivo Van Hove production, the man is kind of the center. Um, however, if you put both plays together, uh, Cornelius Melody is gone at the end of A Touch of the Poet and he's dead, his wake begins more stately mansions, which is about a 11 hour play if it were produced uncut. So he's not in most of it. Uh, Simon Harford, uh, Sarah's husband is an offstage character only. He appeared in earlier drafts of A Touch of the Poet, but when O'Neill finished it, he wrote Simon out of the play and he's only referred to. Sarah is a major character in both plays. And I would say she is the, I, you know, she is the immigrant story. She is coming first generation Irish. She is the one who wants to rise in the world. She is carrying the theme of possessiveness and greed and the desire for more countered by her actual loving relationships toward both her father and Simon Harford. So it, it gets complicated in that way. Um, she's also the one who drives the action. She's the one who saves Simon at the end of that play. She's a character who does something. Simon's actually quite passive. And while he does have some of the same pecuniary instincts as Sarah in terms of building his business, uh, one, it's actually Sarah who turns out to possibly be a better businessman than him. And secondly, he's only in business as revenge against his mother, not for any real desire on his part. So I really see in this, you know, 20 year gestation period between mm -hmm. books and a desire, you know, to get something right. Um, that struck me uh, completely. Um, and it was, you know, due uh, mostly to the work of uh, a woman named Martha Gilman Bauer, whose papers I heard a couple of times, who who had who made the rediscovery of the original um, uh, more stately mansions typescript in 1988, and uh, also uh, Felicia Harris Hardison Landre uh, wrote a book called uh, Modern or Yes, modern playwriting, modern American playwriting in the 1940s. And she'd asked me to write the uh, O'Neill section in that book. And that's when, you know, in searching for a focus on that, I ended up focusing on the female characters in, in The Iceman Cometh. Good time there, female characters in The Iceman Cometh. Long Day's Journey into Night, Touch of the Poet, and, and uh, Moon for the Misbegotten. And I ended up I, was, I became fascinated with Sarah Melody in that project. And that led, I think, directly into maybe rethinking, not even rethinking. I would say, I wouldn't say it's rethinking. I would say it's thinking for the first time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to I um, uh, share something you wrote in, you, in, in the current book about Sarah. 
Uh, yeah. it, it's just it's just a list basically, but I think it really goes to uh, her complexity and her centrality. But you you write of Sarah as a description: the ambitious girl, the proud daughter, the sexy seductress, uh, the loving wife, the fertile and doting mother, the matronly housewife, the salacious uh, prostitute, the ruthless businesswoman, the fearful woman, the would-be murderess the compassionate friend and now uh, becomes uh, a repentant sinner. Um, she's clearly central to your vision. She's playing everything in the play, it sounds like. But, but can, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the complexity that you see uh, in this role? But, you know, maybe how it also touches on, um, you know, you also talk about opposites and the battle of opposites within characters. And I think that's yeah. some interesting ground there. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think she has. I think she has the most interesting conflicts in the play, um, and I think she, um, uh, in terms of where O'Neill started, in terms of thinking about greed, possessiveness, uh, uh, the pecuniary instinct, um, uh, you know, it, it bears out, you know, cinegraphically in the play. The play has great cinegraphic possibilities. It starts. You know, a touch of the poets in this sort of shabby tavern. Uh, then more stately mansions opens with a wake of con melody in that same shabby tavern four years later. Um, and then it goes to you, you see both Deborah Harford, Simon's mother's very nice estate, uh, and also Simon and Sarah's uh, very comfortable house that's sort of between. The shabby tavern and 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 Deborah's house, and then and then Sarah inhabits inherits this uh, Simon uh, Deborah's um, mansion, and immediately is in search of you know something bigger and something finer. And by the by the end of more stately mansions, she has this uh, these architectural designs for this massive estate. Uh, uh, that that that's on a little lake with little pleasure craft and has you know uh, horse carriages and uh, is is quite a you know sort of so she has this sort of drawing of it and I've always thought you know cinegraphically it'd be great to have this like projected scenery of this sort of giant thing that she's imagined because that that's the next step and and she thinks oh if I only get this I'll be happy um, in fact I think I sort of even start the book with a with a speech from from where she's dreaming of having all this stuff, and and so I just related that and think of you know I think I mean she's she's a uh, she aspires to all these things and there's no limit to these aspirations and I find that you know interesting and and really attractive I mean it can be repellent it goes down some dark places uh, but she owns it and her speeches are fascinating because she'll go down these tangents and then and say no no I don't mean that you know I I I, I that's that's not me that's not what what I want to do. I love Simon. I don't want to like drive him into this business. I don't want to. And, and then, and then, uh, uh, you know, she'll continue on and she almost seduces his brother. Uh, she doesn't, she pulls back, but she, she sort of all, almost does. And she sort of, you know, be, begins to sort of dress like a uh, dress very voluptuously and uh, outrageously. So again, costume designers, uh, fun. So, so she's just, uh, uh, when I began to think about it, I said, there aren't that many women's roles. Well, one, I thought, you know, O'Neill is underrated as a writer for female roles. And, and two, I thought, this is the best one. She gets to do everything. And so I thought, you know, I really wanted to showcase that. And, uh, uh, it, it's possibly also true, and I put this in the preface, I might as well mention it now, that, that uh, my, my mother died in, right before I started this book, and uh, it became pretty clear to me, maybe at the end of the book, uh, that I was sort of, you know, projecting my mother into this character, um, which is interesting maybe only because there is a mother figure in the play, uh, Deborah, uh, who has a very... Uh, possessive relationship with her son, possibly not entirely different from a relationship with my mother that I experienced, which I don't talk about at all in the book. Uh, I put it all on Sarah. So uh, it, it, it probably has some effect. 
But yeah. I, I also, have, you know, Hedda Gabler, characters like that, I always fall in love with these characters when I'm thinking about them. So I think that's part of it too. Right. I, I, I'll follow up with that. I mean, um, considering that, I mean, you're, you see Sarah so central to, to the cycle, um, and we have one of the two plays as, as we have at this point uh, called A Touch of the Poet. And as I think you even referenced uh, tonight, you know, the, the, whole, the whole cycle at one point was called Touch of the Poet. Where do you see the idea of A Touch of the Poet in your conception of a Sarah central, central figure cycle? Did you, did, what role does that play uh, obviously, it seemed to be a big thing for O'Neill. I'm wondering how it evolves in your mind with Sarah being so prominent. Well, um, probably have to separate me from O'Neill a little bit at this point. And, and you know, maybe you as a director, you know, maybe where I'm going to go here. Um, um, I think some of O'Neill's mistakes with the play plays were maybe focusing on the wrong characters. Uh, Sarah is a character who slipped up on him. And I'd sort of make an analogy early on. Sarah to me is very much like Margaret in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Uh, Tennessee Williams, when he started to write that play was writing about Brick, the son, to the father, Third, maybe Margaret. Um, in the course of writing that play, I think he made Margaret the best character. She's the character who drives the play, and that's what I maybe and that maybe that's an analogy that that uh, that that was a uh, a, a star for me. Uh, Williams has certain notes about liking that character more. I mean, the 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 short story that he based. Uh, uh, cat on a hot tin roof on three players of a summer game. The 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 Margaret character is awful in that in that short story. Um, uh, she's just kind of a man hater uh, and sort of emasculates her husband in that. And and uh, so, but the but the Margaret in the play becomes a lot more than the character that. Tennessee Williams wrote, and he has certain notes about, I'm starting to like this character more and more. O'Neill does a similar thing with Sarah. He begins to write notes, uh, admiring her for what she is when he, when, he, when he didn't like her very much, I don't think, in the beginning. So um, I don't think, uh, so as an interpreter of it, um, I'm, I'm more interested in what I see as results than maybe intentions. And that's something that, uh, Andrew Lee wrote about when he wrote about an article in the Eugene O'Neill Review uh, a couple of years ago, and it, and and I maybe take that in an even wider context in the play to talk about you know this is uh, uh, I, I'm a I'm a results guy uh, I guess uh, uh, and that gives me liberty to maybe uh, run wild with these plays a little bit. Uh, you know what it what it reminds me of as you talk about it, it it kind of reminds me of the way Chris Christopherson becomes Anna Christie, in the sense that uh, my understanding is that you know that the yeah. focus was initially the father. And nobody and it, and nobody it wants to nobody wants to see Chris Christopherson. I mean, I mean that's a I mean that's a dread. I mean O'Neill was right to kind of I mean after it failed out of town to to redo it. And what does he do? He takes you know. Uh, the character of Anna is like, she's like a secretary or something. She's taking dictation or somebody and, and, and falls in love with this really bland guy in Chris Christopherson. And in Anna Christie, you know, she's this uh, prostitute whose father has condemned her to this life by abandoning her. And then she sort of reclaims herself and then falls in love, perhaps not exercising the best discretion in the world, falls in love with this guy who just literally appears out of the sea. And it's, you know, it's wonderful. So it's, it's got all sorts of nuance and stuff. And, and yeah, it's her play. And, and to make it to say it's about old Chris, even though he's talking about that old devil sea all the way through the play. Yeah, 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 I get that. But you don't have a great Anna in that play. You got no play. Right. I, I, will, I will add, though, uh, that I think the role of Captain Jessup is a lost gem uh, in that play. Uh, but but he's yeah <laughs> um, but anyway hey um, 
I, I, one thing, one thing, uh, when, when um, often when people uh, think of the, these two plays, uh, uh, they think of uh, a touch of the poet being uh, very realistic or a, you know, something done in a realistic style and a more stately mansion seems to demand um, going into the world of expressionism. Can you talk a little bit about reconciling the two things in a single cycle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's I think it's one of the great things of the play. Travis Bogard, probably still the you know dean of O'Neill critics, um, he really took more stately mansions to task and downgraded it uh, because it didn't adhere to the same realistic stylistic unity that A Touch of the Poet had established, and that O'Neill would go back to in the plays that he wrote after. Uh, specifically Long Day's Journey, Iceman Cometh, Moon from the Mist Begotten, which I might argue aren't necessarily all realistic either. But, but essentially, A Touch of the Poet adheres to all the tenets of American stage realism. More Stately Mansions starts out that way and then brings in all sorts of stylistic devices from other points in O'Neill's career in terms of long monologues, uh, sort of uh, almost direct address speeches to the audience. Um, uh, at one point, the, at one, in one scene, he lapses into something reminiscent of strange interlude in which characters speak their thoughts aloud while they're all on stage together. Um, the characters uh, dress, particularly Sarah, um, by the time we get to the uh, first scene in act four, she's, uh, uh, the office has been somewhat transformed into a brothel-like environment. She's described as dressing very voluptuously uh, and theatrically, and her uh, movements and the stylized uh, gestures of the characters are are exceed what we would think of as realism in terms of their bouncing back and forth between saying one thing, then saying the opposite, uh, then making a wild move toward uh, another character and then retreating. Um, where Bogard sees that as a breakdown, I see that actually as an example of stylistic unity in the sense of what's happening is, and the stylistic departures only happen after the uh, debate of greed and possessiveness to take over a company to inherit a mansion has been ceded to Sarah and Simon. That's the first time they've ever argued in the play, and we see that happen. And then they their actions become more theatricalized, I would say, as a manifestation of the possessive possessiveness and greed, greedy instincts that are metastasizing on their souls. And then we see the external uh, manifestations of that inner condition. And then it recedes as the play resolves back to the sort of little cabin next door and they're all sort of barefoot in rags at this whole, uh, at the cabin next door as the play ends in the epilogue of More Stately Mansions about 10 or so hours after we started. Uh, so I think that I think it runs a circuit, and so I think I think it all. I, so I think that establishes it as 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 a uh, unified event, and I think it also separates it from what O'Neill did later. I think it kind of puts the button on his uh, on what he was trying to convey, his sort of his his ultimate statement on where uh, the greedy impulses lead us that he'd started in you know, Desire Under the Elms and Marco Millions in the early 1920s. Yeah. Oh, well, um, you, you've got a convert in me. I, I, I definitely think there's so much psychological space in the play that you can do all kinds of uh, theatrical things with it. I think that that's, yeah. you know, it's, it, it almost calls for it, I think. You, you have to have it. Or at least I think the most interesting presentation would have it. Um, one, th one thing that you mentioned in either your preface of the new book or in the introduction is you talk about uh, uh, a little bit about uh, how um, uh, August Wilson um, 
you know, his Pittsburgh cycle and how he try, you know, his, his, his project to kind of uh, talk about the American experience in his case, specifically the African American experience and, and O'Neill's attempt to tell the American story through an Irish immigrant family. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, more about your thoughts about the two, um, the two attempts at, at telling the story and uh, how they're the same or how they're different? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I talk about, I bring up August Wilson early as, as, a, as a comparison, um, but not because August Wilson in any way was influenced by what O'Neill did. I don't have any evidence to suggest that he, he was or would have been interested necessarily. Um, but I, I, I brought it up because August Wilson succeeded in doing what he wanted to do. I mean, that is the bolt. I mean, August Wilson will be remembered for these 10 plays that talk about the black experience in America in 10 separate decades of American history from the first decade of the 20th century until I think the first decade of the 21st century. Um, that's what he's, that's what he will be known for. He finished, the, and he finished those plays. O'Neill didn't finish the cycle. He couldn't. Uh, and one of the main reasons he couldn't is, is he didn't do what August Wilson did. And that was the August Wilson plays are discrete plays. They, they, they don't have overlapping characters except for I think maybe one or two. Um, they are thematically linked, but he's not, he doesn't burden himself by trying to continue a story that he started in one decade into the next decade. They are all independent. O'Neill wanted to write the plays. He, he, he designed his cycle in as much as he designed the cycle to be plays that could stand on their own so that you can see, for example, A Touch of the Poet as a standalone play. And it's produced as such because it doesn't have much to stand with currently. Um, but in constructing his cycle, he tried to tie each play into the next seven generations of a single family. And so when he would work on one play, he would adapt it and make a change that necessitated he change a play three plays prior. Um, and he could never figure it out. He could never get it right. Um, he never had a master narrative going from the beginning to the end. Uh, so the, 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 whole, the whole thing could not cohere because he couldn't make sense from one play, from the beginning play to the end. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it, we, we actually did have a question in the chat that kind of uh, was interested in, in any more uh, you had to say about this notion of how O'Neill wanted to take the story backwards, you know, in time and forwards in time. And, and, and um, you know, uh, do you have any... I guess that that impulse. What, what? What? Why do you think he needed to? Why, why wasn't the the center good enough for him? Why did he have to keep going backwards or forwards, telling more? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I do know what I alluded to earlier. He started getting very interested in Deborah Harford, and he thought it was all about her and her Yankee family. Um, there's nothing about that family or anything he wrote about it that's actually particularly interesting. I mean, he alludes to it. Deborah Harford basically tells the story in A Touch of the Poet, the one scene she's in. She tells the story that, that of, of all the four plays that O'Neill didn't write before A Touch of the Poet. He gives the history of the family. That's about as interesting as it gets. And that's probably about as much as he should have done. Mm -hmm. um, O'Neill had a way of, 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 he would come up with ideas for plays. And if they kept interesting, kept being of interest to him, he would write more about it. And he went through a specific uh, cycle, if you will, of, of uh, development. He writes, start up with an idea, then he writes an outline for the play. If he likes that, he writes a scenario of the play, which is about up to about 25,000 words in prose of everything that's gonna happen in this play. And then if he likes that, he proceeds to write a first draft. Mm -hmm. He wrote four drafts, he got four drafts of A Touch of the Poet. He wrote three drafts of More Stately Mansions. He typed both those plays. Well, he didn't type. His wife typed both those plays multiple times. <laughs> he typed, no, no, none of the other plays was ever typed. 
he only actually wrote first drafts of two more of the plays. And those had to do with Deborah's family. So those would have been the precursor or the plays before, prequels, if you will, to A Touch of the Poet. He wrote first drafts, that both of which were double length. He ultimately destroyed both of those when he had already when he decided to write four normal size plays instead of the two double length plays of where he started with the cycle the four boys he got as far as a scenario with the first play the calms of capricorn the other three plays about the four brothers never got as far as a scenario the last play the hair of the dog never got beyond various speeches or parts of ideas that he collated from earlier plays he'd written. He never wrote a scenario for it. He never wrote as much as a first draft. He only wrote what was interesting to him. And what, what I mean, I, I guess my, maybe the biggest, uh, biggest surprise I had in studying these plays was when I totaled up the actual days he spent working on the project. He spent over half his time on more on A Touch of the Poet and More Stately Mansions. Plays five and six in the 11 play cycle. Those are the cycle plays. That's what he wrote. That's what survives. And, you know, it's, you know, 568 pages. It's a lot. Um, and it, it, it refers to everything he didn't write, but, but, uh, keeps the action on the Melody Harford Alliance and doesn't drift into their all their descendants or in, in either direction, their, their four sons uh, or their uh, Sarah's uh, or the boys, I guess Simon's mother and his aunts. Right. Yeah, actually I wanted to just share one thing that you met, you, you, you put in the book at the end of chapter five. Um, you, you, as you mentioned earlier tonight, uh, O'Neill did write a final speech for the cycle, you know, with hundred year old son, uh, honey. And I, I just really, I really, I really like this last line. I just wanted to share, cause I wasn't aware of this until I read it in your book. Um, but the last line of the cycle as w intended, um, honey says, but take the hair of the dog and the sun will rise again for you and the appetite and thirst will come back and you can forget and begin all over. And I, 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 I do think it's interesting that he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's got his theme, you know, it's right there, you know, at, at that, what he thought was a hundred years later with a, you know, an old man. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I, one, one question uh, we have, um, is uh, did Dow House or California somehow enable the cycle or doom it? Uh, however, and, and then a fo follow up, however you answer, do you think uh, that, uh, uh, excuse me, it, the answer just moved on me. <laughs> um, do you think it could be produced full scale at Dow House? In which case this Dave King will take a front row seat. <laughs> uh, um, I, well, I, I would like, for it to be producible. I have ideas on, on making it producible, which actually involve reducing the size of more stately mansions and, and, and cutting it around Sarah as opposed to Simon and, and, and his mother. I, do, I, do, I think, I think O'Neill gets lost with his mom in the play. Uh, Martha Bauer had a great line. Of course, I stole it. Uh, I think I credited her. I did. Uh, when she said, uh, O'Neill poured his sickness with his mother into this play. Um, and I think, I think there's some evidence that that's true. I, I would like to uh, cure some of that sickness in a, uh, in a re, in a, in a restaging of the play. Um, the, the, in the, in the, uh, the first part of that question, did it enable him, Dow House enable him to write the plays? I, I am an enabler. Uh, so I think, yes, it did enable him to write. I also think, um, I, I, you know, there's 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 lots of stories about you know O'Neill uh, stopped writing the cycle because he realized he could never finish it, and 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 he wanted to write you know the plays that of course he would be forever famous for the Iceman Cometh and Long Day's Journey into Night. Um, I have a little different 
thought about that in that I actually think he stopped the cycle because he'd written what was important. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess, uh, again, Martha Bauer's point about more stately, managed, more stately mansions is it, it's a, it's a, it actually is a finished script. Um, my sort of enlargement of what she talks about is to say that the cycle is finished too. It's finished with these two plays. O'Neill didn't know it, but he wrote in his life, he always wrote what was interesting to him. And he finished that. He started, he, 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 he finished three drafts of more stately mansions in 10 straight months, writing every day. And it's, it's the first thing he did when he moved into Dow House in Danville. Uh, after that, he did the third draft of, of uh, A Touch of the Poet to meld it more with more stately mansions while that was fresh in his mind. After that, in early June of 1939, he started to write the prologue of The Calms of Capricorn, which was the play that follows more stately mansions. He wrote the prologue, looked at it the next day and said, this is terrible and tore it up and destroyed it. And a few days later, he started writing The Iceman Cometh. My, my point is simply by going, by looking at what O'Neill did, not what he intended, but what he did, he was finished with that project and then could do something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, I've got something else from the chat, uh, uh, just a thought. Xander, uh, do you think the missing nine ghost plays, meaning the, the nine plays that didn't get completed uh, or even written, um, that the nine plays could possibly be part of O'Neill's writing process for the plays that he did complete, like in a sense, creative notes that he drew upon. Um, could be, yes. I mean, there's a ton of there's a ton of notes, and and I mean, he he uh, uh, said somebody, you know, I've got you know, I've written eight hundred million notes about these plays, and you know, there's he he undoubtedly destroyed some of them, but there's still a ton of them left. Uh, and they're all up at Yale, uh, at the Beinecke. Um, and they're, they're fascinating. And But you don't have to go to the Yale. Uh, 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 Donald Gallup uh, transcribed all those notes. And that is what his book, Eugene O'Neill and his 11 play cycle, which is again, a book that I'm building on and maybe enlarging upon and, and, and riffing off of in some ways. That is the book that, I mean, as a book, it's difficult because it literally is the transcription of all his notes with, with not a lot of editorial guidance about how to think about them. Uh, and it's chronological, which is difficult too, chronological in terms of, uh, uh, of when O'Neill wrote them, but that doesn't mean how they fit into to, to the thing. Um, all the stories about other plays, other, other plays are interesting to read. Um, um, and I'm sure they influence uh, some of his actual notes about those plays. Uh, maybe more interesting in terms of, of, of an influence on the on, on what does exist um, uh, than I mean, because they really aren't plays. These other things they they just didn't get to the play form yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I can totally see that. Um... I, I wanted to share a, a comment uh, where my, my comment went, but uh, uh, hold on. Things keep moving on me. Uh, yeah, but me uh, um, um, uh, Dan McGovern uh, shares that he and uh, Carolyn saw the, the premiere of more stately mansions in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and Ingrid's legs were a matter of indifference uh, <laughs> that they love the book. Um, uh, you know, one thing, one thing I was curious about, you, you talk about in your book, you talk about what I would almost call the custody battle over the narrative of what happened to the cycle. Um, you know, and in a sense, in, in which case, I think you're kind of advocating for uh, more stately mansions, the theatrical orphan uh, that needs somebody to claim it. But, but can you just share with us a little bit of, I, I found that really interesting, kind of the, how, how the stories about what happened to the cycle uh, got told and changed and adjusted um, by Carlotta or some of the biographers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'll, I'll tell a little. This, this will get into any, a lot, of, a lot of alleys of arcane stuff that maybe 
not all of our audience will appreciate as much as I have come to. Uh, so and, and so I'm going to I'm going to rattle on. But it, it I, I found it. I find the stories fascinating in terms of how the plays happened. Um, um, but in a nutshell, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I uh, one of the people to whom I dedicated the book was the woman I've mentioned a couple of times, Martha Gilman Bauer, um, because she is the person who made the rediscovery as late as 1988. It had been there for almost 40 years, this typescript of more stately mansions. Uh, other people had seen it, but they hadn't talked about it as though it were a, an important document. Um, and uh, when I was up at the Beinecke and got to look at that manuscript, I, my, like in about five minutes, I thought, holy cow, this is like a fascinating living document of what happened when uh, and how this, I mean, it, it, the document itself tells the story of its, uh, of its evolution and of its coming into being because it's not just, it's a typescript, 279 pages of this play, but it's not a clean copy of that. It, it, it has all of O'Neill's notes and edits on it as, as the actual process of creation, uh, as I sort of interpolated it, was he was writing in longhand as his wife was typing it. And then they would trade information back and forth and she would, she would make notes and she would type certain things again. So there's, there's, it's literally a cut and paste document in the old school way that us pre-Mac people used to cut and paste research papers by, you know, literally cutting out sections and patting it on a new page. So there's 62A and 73C and half pages and quarter pages and arrows going, you know, says now go to here kind of thing. So you get the, this, the, and they, they're, uh, O'Neill has a diary that he dates his things and she has a diary of when she's doing things and to collate this information together, you get a sense of how it came into being. So that was uh, uh, just how it, it, it manifested itself was, was fascinating. It was just, you know, it's kind of, you know, breathtaking to, to get to hold its pages, not, a, not even a holograph, but the, the sort of original. I, I, it, was, it was like one of the great experiences of my life. Uh, um, the stories around that typescript had to do with like who owned it, um, uh, which was, you know, first uh, O'Neill died in 1953. The play hadn't been produced. It was Carlotta's manuscript. So she's got her signature blazoned across it and her address where she lived after at the Lowell Hotel in New York, where she lived after O'Neill died. She handed it off to a producer in, in, uh, uh, Sweden, who produced it in 1962. Then her friend, who became a friend, Donald Gallup, who was the curator at Yale, translated it into English using a Swedish dictionary, and I suppose referring to the, to the uh, 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 original typescript, sort of turned it back into an English, what was supposed to be a reading edition that was published by Yale in 1964. That edition became the basis for the 1967 production. When he, uh, Carlotta changed her mind, said, well, let's go ahead and produce this thing. Uh, and, and, but Jose Quintero, the director, the famous O'Neill interpreter, made a lot of changes in that uh, and also had to change it in terms of, of time to get it down to under just under three hours. So that he didn't have to pay uh, the theater didn't have to pay the uh, the stagehands overtime. So you got to get it got to get it done by eleven. Um, when Ivo Vanhove uh, did the uh, 1997 production, he used that script, made some of his own changes. If you've, if you've ever seen a production by Ivo Vanhove, he's not that interested in text anyway, so it probably didn't matter. Uh, what he used. But all this to say is this adapted script became known before the original was ever recognized, which was not until uh, 1988 when uh, Martha made this discovery and published it at Oxford University Press at the same time that it was published in the complete play, the complete plays of Library of America 
uh, published, uh, edited by Travis Bogard. Um, if you get, if you look at the Library of America edition, which which totally usurped um, the uh, Oxford edition because it had at that time all of O'Neill's plays. It's a three volume, very handsome Library of America kind of way, three volume set. Uh, you'd never know that Martha Gilman Bauer did that work. Um, she's not listed anywhere except on a footnote uh, on page 954, even though her, her work is over 25% of volume three. Um, I've heard her speak about these things and it's sort of and as early as 2003, I think when there was a conference in France and I heard her deliver this paper uh, and I was, uh, it's some, I guess it stuck in my mind. I never thought I would be writing about the cycle plays of Eugene O'Neill, but uh, I was, I, she told a great story about how, you know, she, uh, she'd been sort of, uh, she had not gotten her due. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I, I, I think one of the things I, I wanted to do with this book was to uh, uh, pay my respects, which are late, but, uh, but, but, but give her that due. Great. I've got, I, I'm, I'm starting to get some signals to start wrapping up, but I've got three things in the chat that I'd love to. Okay. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to do a quick answer. Well, well, I know the first one will not, but try, but do, do what you can. All right. Um, Thanks. <laughs> actually, by definition, you would laugh. At, um, but could you could you compare and contrast "Morning Becomes oh. Electra" with the cycle? Now, I, I, you could talk for hours on that, probably. But any any quick thoughts about "Morning Becomes Electra"? You know, as a, a sprawling epic tale of something versus this the cycle. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I, I love Morning Becomes Electra because I mean, and the Civil War setting is fantastic. The idea of retelling the Oresteia in modern terms uh, without uh, uh, replacing the gods with modern psychology, you know, interesting. I mean, Lavinia is a great character. Um, I guess what I'll say, my short answer, Sarah's better. Sarah's better than Lavinia. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I do think, uh, I, think uh, I think the cycle plays to A Touch of the Poet, More Stately Mansions are, are sprawling in that way. Um, I think they can be made to cohere to about the same length as More Stately, or as Morning Becomes Electra. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a great correspondence. You know. Great. Cool. Um, um, sure. this, one, this one's like a top of, off the top of your head kind of thing. Okay. What do you think the title should be of the whole cycle as you have have it conceived? Um, I don't know. Of course, I've, 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 uh, I've not you know, even said the title that O'Neill had it. O'Neill's title ultimately, after several versions, he originally called the cycle A Touch of the Poet. That was the original name of the cycle. Uh, after he named a play, The Touch of the Poet, he couldn't very well have the whole cycle that. So his his title for this uh, for the cycle was uh, a tale of possessors self dispossessed. Um, that is a terrible title. Um, <laughs> O'Neill usually has great titles. A Touch of the Poet, great title. More stately mansions, great titles from a poem poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, although Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote that poem after the time in which More Stately Mansions is set, which is a point that, that Donald Gallup makes in his book and that I steal. Um, uh, well, sight. Um, um, no, that's my short answer. I don't have a better title, but I, I would say this. I've thought, I have thought about it. And if, uh, if, if uh, I were to have my name on, on the production I have in mind, of the two plays, edited as I see fit, edited down to a to a to a workable size, I I would need another title, and it wouldn't be that one. It wouldn't be a tale of possessors self dispossessed. No one wants to see that play. <laughs> okay, um, and our last point, which I think is a nice way to end, uh, I, I, here I've got in the chat, Xander. The last uh, the last line of your book states, "Time draws nigh for the great work of the cycle to begin." And the question is, how would you like to see it begin? Um, well, the cycle to me is a touch of the poet and 
more stately mansions produced together back to back. Um, that, that closing line is an allusion to the last line in Tony Kushner's Angels in America. Um, I, as another analogy, I see these two plays uh, having the same uh, in, in line with Millennium Approaches and Perestroika, the two plays of, 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 of uh, uh, Angels in America. Um, that was the nearest, that's the nearest comp I could get to. So that's, I mean, I'm sort of in, I mean, I, I reference Angels in America as a work of what Jonathan Kalb calls marathon theater, I'm talking about sort of the value in going through a long experience. So um, uh, Kushner, of course, uh, is a tremendous fan of O'Neill and has done a lot to promote O'Neill, has used his celebrity and fame uh, and the success of Angels in America to, to draw attention to Eugene O'Neill. So uh, that's kind of me doffing my hat to him and thanking him for that. And plus it's a cool line. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone who joined us this evening and encourage everyone, if you haven't already, uh, to get a hold of a copy of Xander's book, Magnum Opus. And, uh, and yeah, we, we hope to uh, uh, see all of you in one form or another in the near future. But Xander, thank you so much. For thank you. And Eric, let me just let me let's say one final thing here. I was, I was saying this to uh, Allie and Carol, maybe before you logged on, we started. I mean, I've complained so much about it, doing things on Zoom and, you know, we've, I've done my fair of belly aching about the pandemic. Um, but this event tonight, I realize, is one that could not possibly happen. Uh, would not happen in this way if we were not under these conditions. And we would not, I mean, I could come out to the foundation and talk to you out there, but I couldn't talk to all, everybody else concurrently. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful uh, for this experience. I'm, 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 I'm humbled by the number of people who uh, came to this chat. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Xander. And I, I just want to say thank you to Carol Weinstra and Ali Bodden and uh, Teresa Morley. Uh, and again, thank you, Xander. And uh, we appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. Good Bye -bye. night. Good night.